All right, everybody. Hey, we are back with our next amazing note rock star, note investing rock star. This guy, it's not it's not often you come across somebody who is created and sold over uh, you know a hundred million dollars. <laughs> In owner finance notes, and so I don't, I don't know if we're there yet, but we're going to be there pretty soon. You're, you're pretty close. I think you're, you're pretty on, close. We're on our way. That's you're right. on your way, exactly. And uh, I will tell you this: you know, mm -hmm. we've got a true note pro. We got Nick the Note Guy. I'm Scott the Note Guy for years. Nick the Note Guy out here, who's also a fellow Austinite here uh, on Note Camp here. Yeah, exactly. Now. There we go. So we're glad to have Nick here. Nick, how's your how's your weekend going so far for you, buddy? Good, man. It's going good. I mean, I'm. Uh, it's uh, Sunday, but hey, I, I work all the time. It's not really work when you're doing what you enjoy to do, that's for sure. Exactly. And the fact that we can do it from home, where they're, ha where they're having to jump on a plane, get up, you know, up late the night before, too much <laughs> up, uh, adult beverages, and, and then go it's downstairs. And network. It's, it's exactly. A good hour and a half here for you. Uh, for you, but we're we're glad to have you speaking here at Note Camp for the first time, and hopefully yeah. as well. So. Thanks, for, thanks for having me on. I'm excited to to share some of the some of my uh, knowledge and experience with uh, the viewers and the listeners wh wherever they might be, and you know I'm not a professional educator, I'm not a professional speaker. I and uh, uh, but I do I I talk about what I do. I mean I think that's what's really important. I actually do what I'm going to talk about today, and I've been doing it for a long time. And it may not be the right strategy for some or all, but it's worked well for me, and I. And I know it's something that isn't very well known of uh, because a lot of it's we sort of brought back old school in a lot of ways. So it's um, hopefully it's a, a value to people that are that are going to stick around and listen to us. Yeah, we've got we've got investors from all across the country, even got some international player, Canada, Australia, England, right. Israel join here. So, yeah. And then, of course, the replays that go out to everybody. So we got uh, viewers online and viewers here domestic. So just, just thank you so much for coming on and speaking. Well, here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, right. no problem. So I'll jump off here, but I'll be lurking with comments. Lurking, then... lurking. Please, please uh, chime in anytime. Don't fall, we'll do don't, fall, don't fall asleep on me, man. I can't. Oh, go. no. <laughs> All right. Let me uh, I got to fold this up and we'll get going here. Give me one second. We got to go. It's a little hard doing two things at once here. Here we go. And OK, I'm going to share my screen and we should be ready to roll. Can you see my screen OK? Yes, sir. Perfect. All right, let's do this. So uh, what I want to talk about today is uh, what I call the perfect note blueprint. I mean, at the end of the day, we most people that are in the note business, uh, they learn how to buy notes. They, how to, they learn how to uh, perform due diligence. Um, but they don't really necessarily understand how to create that note from the beginning. And I'm going to take uh, the, you know, a good portion of the, my time today explaining exactly what that means, uh, where I think the opportunities are, and more importantly, how I do it, uh, how we do it ourselves. So uh, let's go to the next screen here. So um, as Scott said, aka Nick the Note Guy, I get to be Note Guy because I'm older than Scott. Uh, if I pass away suddenly, Scott can take that. <laughs> the main thing that, I love that. Until then, uh, we'll, we'll both be note guys because that's what we are. So, uh, I've been actually in real estate since uh, about 2001. Um, did everything the wrong way. There wasn't education like there is today. There wasn't what we're doing today in in 2001, 20 years ago. Data wasn't readily available. Things just weren't like they are now. So we have this unique opportunity to absorb content and make decisions based on information that we're able to get at just basically a touch of a touch of a button, search of a Google, you know, whatever it might be, YouTube. So I started a company in 2012 called Rylex Capital. And the, the intention of that company was to create an opportunity for home ownership to hardworking uh, families and individuals that had been told no by the bank. Sort of just sort of stumbled across how to do that. I'm not gonna really get into the, the backstory of it because I don't have enough time and we got some great guests con coming on after me, so I don't want to lose that, uh, lose sight of that. But I started a company, and I, I started with, um, I started myself. But shortly after I founded it, I brought in a partner by the name of John Montero. Now, uh, anybody that's in multifamily space now may have come across John Montero because after we sold Rylex Capital, John decided to go more into the multifamily space. I took a couple of years sabbatical away, and then I came back in and. Now we'll talk about what I'm doing. So, but we built this company to sell. We didn't know if we were going to sell it. It was all around creating mortgage notes. 
in a seller finance capacity uh, uh, to uh, non-traditional buyers that couldn't get bank financing. Uh, we built this up and then we end up, of all things, selling it, uh, all the capital, all the assets and all, a lot of the notes and our, our proprietary uh, technologies and everything that we had, our employees, of, to all people or all things, a, a federally chartered bank. So it's sort of interesting how they couldn't create uh, what uh, they weren't allowed to create notes like we could create, but they can go out and buy it, and which is what they did. Um, then in 2019, I created USA Note Pro, which is my my primary function uh, in life today from a business perspective, and that was really to uh, buy, sell, create, and educate uh, regarding mortgage notes. But I I emphasize create because there's just not many people that I know of at least, and I'm fairly well connected in the space that really understand how to create the perfect note. Banks know how to create notes because that's what they do, right? Financial institutions, you know, Chase, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, they have internal staff and they're, re they're regulated on how to do it. But as you'll see in the statistics as we go on, most people do not, um, either because they don't know how or they're not required to because of how Dodd-Frank is written, written and we'll talk about that in a second. Then in 2020, I created a sort of a spinoff company called Wholesaler Helper. So if there's any wholesalers, that are on the call and are trying to figure out what the hell they're going to do next uh, because they uh, haven't been able to uh, crack that code um, when it when it shifts to a really strong buyer's market uh, in, in the real estate space. Uh, th this might be some valuable information for them as well. And then in 2021, I created uh, we my partner, my my partner and myself, Eric Sage, uh, created the Creative Dealmaker Academy, which is is a it's the the precursor to the note creating process, which is really how to find the deal, how to fund the deal, how to structure the deal, how to find a buyer, and then get into the note creation. So, and then where I am today is between now and hopefully the end of 2023, um, we'll have created in just in this uh, 18 month period, you know, close to our, from our, our projections, a hundred million dollars in performing notes that are all done exactly how we're gonna talk about today. And there's gonna be an opportunity for those uh, that are note buyers to participate, maybe be in a fund, use, if you have a retirement account, we can talk about that as we go along. If you have any questions, you can surely re reach out as well. Um, I, like I said before, I've done about 800 creative deals personally. Where that, when I say personally, I mean, my name is on the closing documents, okay? I don't, not, that's, that's just my deal flow itself. 1,100 transactions, uh, probably way more than that. And who knows how many countless other thousands of just from consulting and whatnot. So, uh, you know, why should anybody listen to me? I guess, I mean, uh, I'm, I don't do this very often uh, unless it's a situation like this. Um, I don't, I'm not on the, I'm not on the circuit, you know, per se, but you may have seen me on uh, or heard me on podcasts or from the front of the stage in events on either the real estate or the note side. I've written some publications, but anyway, um, you know, Google me, listen to me. You like what I say, great. If you don't like what I say, great. I don't really care. This is really about me sharing with you on exactly what I do, why I do it and how I do it. So who is this information for? And I wanna get in the nuts of it. If you're a wholesaler, you probably should listen to what we're talking about here. If you're a note investor, which I think a lot of people are, either aspire to be or currently are, um, is something that's going to be of value there. If you're a landlord, this is a great um, opportunity because landlords, are, are they're, it's in their DNA about cash flow. A lot of people don't know that you can obtain cash flow by controlling versus owning uh, real estate, which is exactly what the banks do. But we don't really think about it that way. And I always joke around with all my um, friends and, that are uh, landlords. And I always joke about it. I go, the reason why you're a landlord is because you haven't figured out how to be a lean lord yet, right? You haven't figured out how to control without owning. And, you know, you can make the depreciation argument all you want, but I sure like amortization uh, probably more than depreciation in single family. And this is what we're talking about today. We're talking about single family home ownership. If I wanted depreciation or I wanted to do something else, I do some kind of a commercial transaction, multifamily story, something like that. That's what that's what it's good for. But single family, I'm a note guy. I don't do anything else but notes in single family. If you're an IRA, uh, if you're a lender or an IRA investor and you're trying to deploy capital, work with a lot of family offices where it's about uh, asset preservation, something to probably look and listen to if you're uh, 
you know, that's one of the focuses that you have. All right. Fix and flippers. Um, oh, you know, uh, you know, that's getting tough if you're a fix and flip guy, because now you, instead of fix and flipping and selling it to a retail buyer, you could probably fix and flip and sell it to an owner finance buyer, still stay in the deal and hold the note for cash flow instead of treating it as a transactional model. And we work with a lot of those um, uh, types of investors as well. All right. So <clears throat> first thing I want to ask is why you should ask yourself why you should create a perfect note. And I just call it a perfect note because it's it's the opposite of what most notes are created. And we'll talk about that here in a second. So that's one question we're going to ask and answer. And then another question we're going to talk about is how big is the seller carry market? Okay. Well, I think let's just start with that. So the seller carry market is about $27 billion. Okay. That's all mortgages that are written that don't have the name of Wells Fargo, Chase, Bank of America, Mono. Okay. It's a substantial number. A lot of people don't even know that this market exists. I would imagine a, lot, a good portion of the people that are listening today, today that have some uh, experience in notes may have some understanding of this. Uh, but over the last four years, we're talking over $100 billion in seller-created paper. Now, what's interesting about this paper and what people don't really talk about is the quality of the paper, okay? The quality of the seller financing paper. We talk about how it's a $27 billion, uh, you know, it was $27 billion in 2021. It's number is going to only go up uh, moving forward because banks have tightened up their requirements for underwriting. Uh, rates have gone up. There's not nearly the gap any longer between going get, getting a traditional mortgage and providing seller financing uh, to a buyer. So that's a big factor. Uh, but 90% of that paper, and anybody that can, can, can probably attest to this that's actually bought somebody else's notes before, can, can attest to how the flaws and the errors and there's omissions of documentation. It's just not, it's not written illegally. It's just not written with best business practices in mind, how a bank would do it, okay? Then we're gonna talk about that as little. So 90% is, is what I would call flawed paper. It's called scratch and dent, which causes the discount that sellers of notes have to take that we are taught as note buyers to look for to create the value proposition to get the yield up or whatever it is we're looking for. But really, most people would prefer a high quality brand new note that there's no scratches and dents on whatsoever. So I'm going to talk about how we can create that or how you can even buy it. Okay. So why is the seller market, why is the seller carry market so big? And this is another question I, I always wanted to know the answer to because $27 billion, um, it's not a small number. It's a fairly large number that not many people even know about. Well, there's two reasons I attribute the seller carry market to be so big. One, 60 to 70%, depending on where you get your, your news and your data from, uh, borrowers can't qualify for a traditional mortgage. They fail, the, they fail to check all the boxes, what I call a pretty buyer, where they don't meet the DTI requirement, which that the income, the credit score is not right. They haven't been in their job long enough. They don't have the proper down payment. One of those factors will disqualify them. And 60 to 70% of um, the buyer pool cannot qualify. No one ever talks about this. OK, but it's a huge, huge number. Um, but now we're going to see why this is important. And if you're a seller, if you're a seller of property, how, why this is important when you start struggling to get your asking price when you sell by being able to provide seller financing is a tremendous opportunity to get your price and get value out of creating a note on behalf of a, of a buyer directly. The other thing is <clears throat> on this in this example or in this model is that less than 5% of all the properties that are available for sale in any market are even available to purchase with owner financing, okay? So out of 100, so let's look at the, the economics of this because this is really important. If there's 100 properties available in the market for sale, only five, five or less than 5% of them are available on terms. Well, if 60% of those buyers that are looking need financing, it seems to me, and I wasn't great in math and I wasn't really good at, uh, in school, but I did understand the basic concepts, concepts of economics 101, supply and demand. If you have supply and it's in high demand, you're controlling the hammer. And if you have the inverse of that as well. So you have the unique opportunity to control both sides 
of this equation. You can provide seller financing to the 60%, 70% they can't go get a bank loan, and you can provide properties for them to buy where only 5% of the marketplace even allows it. So that's what makes this market so valuable and even more valuable moving forward. So um, this information comes from uh, Advanced Data, which is Scott Arpin and Tracy Rui at Node Investing Tools. Thanks to both of them for providing some of this data and content. Um, uh, just, I just, I just want to share some visuals on this. I'm in the tech, I'm in the Texas market. Even if I was in anywhere else, I would only do deals in Texas personally. It's just the best place to do deals. I mean, no one's leaving Texas going to California, not anytime soon. Okay, that could change. But Texas is a great market. That's why it's a large percentage of the seller carry market. No buyers want to buy in Texas. People want to live in Texas. Other states too, but it's a very, very popular market. When you and if you have a note that you're looking to buy and or sell, and it's in a desirable area, you're going to have to either pay a premium or you're going to get a premium price for it. Okay. Other states are good too. We do stuff in those states as well. Just Texas is best. Don't mess with Texas, baby. Yeah, I know. I, I know. I say that when they say when, it's funny when you say that. When they when I I always think when they say don't mess with Texas, I really I really think they mean they mean don't me mess with Texas banks or Texas yeah. numbers, because you do not win, you do not beat the Texas lenders and banks in the state of Texas. Oh, that's, that's the truth. Cool. That is a true statement. You're going to get your, you're going to get what you get coming back. So I only want to show this graph visually, because if it starts in 2009 and goes to 2021, but as you can see, starting in, it, it, it was a gradual growth up. And reason being, in my opinion, is because banks were really, got really tight on uh, they got their hand slapped in 2008 and their, their, their underlying guidelines got really tight. So people couldn't go get a traditional mortgage. And that started this trend going up. As we got into 2014 and 15, it started sliding down. And I don't think that seller financing went away. What I think that we started to see is that we started to have a, um, sellers could be more picky on who they could sell to. They weren't even necessarily selling the retail buyers. This is when hedge funds started coming in i buyers things along those lines started really hitting the market and overpaying for properties and made it quote unquote easier for the seller to sell without doing a whole lot of heavy lifting that's starting to change and that's what we're going to see as we get into 2021 and we look out a few more years this this graph will continue to grow but the overall number has not really declined as far as the revenue side of it goes um just another couple things on statistics i'm sort of a stat nerd uh, residential makes up about 53% of all the seller carry. Um, a lot of people don't even know that you can owner finance land or owner finance commercial properties. Heck, before 1990, almost everything was transacted this way and banks got a little bit wise to it and it got, they wanted, they found a, it was better to reset the mortgage and have somebody requalify. So these are just some of the statistics here. Just another slide here I want to point out. In 2017, we were about almost 8 billion in seller carry volume. In 2021, we're almost almost 15. Hasn't quite doubled, it'll probably be doubled by next year. Um, why is that? Well, to think the same reasons we said, it's a substantial part of the industry, um, which is where most of the people's notes come from that don't look to buy notes. So we wanna talk about those here. So um, another, another stat I just wanna show, um, this shows LTV about 77%, but what I thought was interesting on this slide that, uh, over year over year, it had gone up 49% in, in the, the value, meaning in this slide here shows $269,000. That seems awful high to me. I didn't, I can't, I don't have a way to verify this data, but that tells me that people are getting more and more comfortable with seller financing as an option. Five, 10 years ago, people, the, the houses that were sold on seller financing were, were beater houses, man. They were stuff that would never pass an FHA inspection. You couldn't get a mortgage on them because either the value, the value was too low, something along those lines. But now we're seeing really nice properties turning into seller financing. I think landlords are getting um, getting uh, smarter and they're going, well, heck, I can get the same amount of net cash flow, if not more, by uh, becoming becoming the bank versus being a landlord, and they're okay doing so. This is an interesting slide here because this is what I want to really, this is where I really want to start diving into that over the last 12 months, and this number has actually gone up and only 84, uh, that 84% 84 of all notes uh, that are created um, are one note creators, okay? 
And let's talk about this for a second. When I say that is that they're probably mom and pop note writers um, that have no experience in writing notes, no experience in underwriting. And as a result, you have inferior files and collateral files that are um, that have a lot of holes in them, um, which it's one thing to nego- it's one thing to negotiate it, the risk, the negotiate the price based on risk, but it's another thing not to have a an accurate an accurate accurate file. And the biggest thing I see personally in this 84% is that since Dodd Frank, uh, you know, you're anybody can write just one and not have to really abide by any of the Dodd Frank requirements or rules. I think that's highly um, foolish, in my opinion. I would never write. Uh, I would never tell anybody to write a note without doing an underwriting, uh, underwriting the buyer, doing have an RMLO do that that process. It's just too important relative to the to that to just a lot of different things, especially note value. Um, but most of these notes that we see, that's what's happening is they're not professionally underwritten. A, because they don't know how to, or B, because uh, it's not required. So it's a big number. And that's the, that's the kind of paper that most people that are looking at buy notes have to, have to determine if it's worth buying or not and trying to assess the risk that's very subjectively, uh, uh, it's very subjective. When you have a fully stacked underwriting file, it becomes very, it's a very objective process on the value because all the, all the boxes are checked, T's are crossed, I's are dotted, and it's a very well written um, note and a very well stacked file. And we're gonna show that here in a second. Um, there again, I just a sort of recap on it, just shows a little bit of how some of the volumes, is. it's fluctuated. And you know, it's around 15% of, of the, all the notes are written, are written pr- what I would call by professionals, pros, which is what we fall into and how we teach other people to do it. Um, but um, that doesn't mean they're always doing it the correct way either, because I know this for a fact, because we consult with them, uh, people that have written 50, 100 notes, and there's just mistakes all in it. And um, really important. The reason why I learned all this, oh, how come I, I found all this out? Because when we were selling Rilex Capital, they were doing. They were. They were basically ripping across our file folders, and all the, of all their notes are written. And they were telling us what we did right and what we didn't do right. And we made the we were able to make those changes and adjustments because we probably wrote 500 notes um, where I would say uh, they weren't correctly. Uh, they weren't. They were poorly written relative to how they're they're written today. So, um, you know, your ability to learn from this, I think, is extremely valuable. Um, if you're really going to get into that, either buying a note or creating a note. So let's continue on. So, you know, I want to talk a little bit about what is being the bank, because you may have a lot of people on this call that never, that just say, hey, notes sound cool. I saw something, you know, on a on a video. I thought I'd just check it out. Well, being the bank is just control versus owner, right? It's what banks do, right? Banks learned a long time ago, hey, let's control that own. Banks don't really own anything, not intentionally at least. It's about amortization versus depreciation. Um, it's a secured asset. Well, sometimes you have secured assets and other things. It's about being a lien lord, not a landlord, okay? So why be the bank? Well, we talked about that a little bit already, but the couple of things that I like about being the bank, it just gives you more options. And if you have the ability, a lot of people think creating a note and being, and being the bank is hard. It's really not. I would argue that if you have the right systems and processes in place, it's easier to do the original creating yourself than it ever is to go um, buy a note and try to underwrite and review every paragraph of every page of every document in an underwriting file. And I think that's where a lot of people really make a uh, a fundamental mistake is that um, they sort of glaze over it. They think it looks good, the note's performing, but it ends up becoming a, a problem and a job um, unless you're just a seasoned non-performing note specialist which uh, I am not, and I have no desire to have non-performing notes because I don't have to. I have high quality performing notes. Why would I want non-performing? I, I'm perfectly content with the yield and the consistency of what a performing note provides. Um, the other thing is that uh, the pretty buyer avatar is declining. We talked about that 60 or 70%. And honestly, uh, you know, hedge funds um, are, are, are going away from the, from the sellers in a lot of different categories. And to be quite honest with you, hedge funds just don't buy everything. Hedge funds don't buy everything in secondary or tertiary markets. Hedge funds don't always buy stuff 
older than 1980 or less than three bedrooms or in a population size of under 100,000 or whatever it might be. So you have the ability to provide opportunity in the markets where hedge funds don't, don't normally participate in. So why does this model work? So just, just a recap on it. Well, you know, it's a big market. It's lower, it's low risk with high yields and it's securitized. Um, but 80% of these buyers um, or 80% of renters rent because they have to, not because they want to. So when you're able to, I cannot tell you how many buyers uh, we've sold properties to and our clients have sold properties to where they, where the buyer says, I've been told for years and years and years that I can't buy because I can't qualify. And that's just not true. It's just, they can't qualify traditionally with the bank. These buyers are every bit as, every bit as good, um, if not better than the, the borrowers that banks qualify. They just have a little bit different path to get there. Okay. So why is this important? So I'm going to just talk about the value proposition just for a second. Okay. So what we do with our clients is that we help them create performing seller financing notes. We recommend creating a first and a second lien for a lot of different reasons if they're creating them, because when they create a first and a second, then it allows them to stay in and maturely participate in the back end, but it also provides a lower investment to value to the first, uh, the first lien note buyer. But all this is done for you. So really uh, think of it this way. Um, you, you have to find the property, you have to analyze the deal, you have to figure out how to fund it and you have to sell it, right? Which is no different than anything else on the real estate side of a transaction. Whether you're a wholesaler, a landlord, fix and flipper, whatever, there's it all starts with that. The difference is once you get to the once you get to the exit and the creating of the note. Well, what we've done through USA No Pro is that we've we were able to provide that opportunity for the manage the transaction. And the reason why we do that is because we're note buyers, okay? So we're a note buyer and we know what the note should consist of. And that's what we like to see. So we stopped trying to, because people would send us notes all the time and we'd have to look at it and the amount of time and energy and effort just to review a file and find out that it wasn't going to work um, was just painful to be quite honest with you. So we just provide it and say, look, we'll, we'll, do, we'll, we'll help do this work and hold you in and you stay out of the way. But all the documents are fully underwritten. They're Dodd Frank compliant. They're qualified mortgages. We do we we don't do contract for deeds. We do only um, mortgages of trust. It's all third party, all third party service. It's all managed in house. We're able to control the the, the chain of custody of the file. Um, you know, um, we're able to do mortgage post closing quality control if need be. And then we talk about you know whether you you can write just one note, but to get maximum value, we've learned, and we'll talk about these ratios here in a minute sell the first, keep the second, keep the cash from the down payment, move on. Our note buyers are ourselves, um, but there's also Fortune 500 companies, banks, family offices, private equity groups, um, which don't like to necessarily deal with the one-offs. They want to have it in a, in a tranche and be able to do it. And we're able to do those kind of things. So, you know, if you have a note that you're thinking about creating, you want us to look at it and you want us to help you uh, structure it, reach out to us. We'll give you some information on how to do it. It's extremely inexpensive. It will cost you twice as much to do it yourself. It'll cost you five times as much if you do it wrong. I can promise you. So um, let's go on to this next slide here. So the note creating process, what does that mean? Well, I just said how you find it, analyze it, fund it, and find a buyer. And then everything in the red is the stuff that's done that can be done for you. This is where a lot of the mistakes are made. I don't write my own promissory notes. I don't write my own documents. That's what the professionals get to do. Everything's done at the title company, at the servicer, at the underwriter, with the attorneys. It's all done in a very specific package and fashion that we've already reviewed and approved. And it's just plug and play based on our, our criteria. So if you want to learn how to sort of maybe structure a note, if you go to cashflowdealmachine.com, you can download a copy of an, our sort of our pre- um, it's a spreadsheet. It just shows you how to plug in information and sort of how to structure the note for maximum value. Because whether you're a note creator or a note buyer, I, I just want to be extremely transparent on why this is important for both parties, all parties involved. Because if you're creating and you're selling it, there's benefit to the note buyer. But if you're staying in the deal as well, in the second lien position, that benefits you because there's cash flow as the creator, but it also benefits um, the, the, the first lien buyer. Okay. 
So, and this is basically what it is. So, and when you do the perfect note, it's really a win-win-win. The note creator wins because they may not be able to sell this to a retail buyer. Maybe it can't pass an FHA inspection, for example. Well, guess what? You don't have to pass an FHA inspection. You just have to have a price that's in line with value and something that a seller and a buyer agreed to, 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 to do. The new homeowner wins because we already talked about that. They weren't able to buy a house to begin with, okay? Or they couldn't qualify for the house they wanted to buy. The note buyer wins because of the three items here in the yellow. We're only gonna, they're only buying a 75% or, uh, or less of, of, the, of uh, the value of the property. So their investment value is lower and they, we're trying to get that down closer to 70%. So it just puts them in a much better position from a risk, um, from a risk perspective, okay? Um, like I said, the it's a fully underwritten buyer. We don't do CFDs. Um, you can do a CFD if you want to do a CFD. We have no interest in them. Um, I don't believe there's any additional protection personally with doing a CFD, but I don't do business in all 50 states, so I can't speak to that uh, personally. But I do know this. I don't know of one bank in the United States that does loans in any of the 50 states that does a contract for deed instead of a mortgage or deed of trust. And I always said, if it's good enough for the banks, it's probably good enough for most. And I, that's the policy and, and um, position that I have on that. And then what I think is a, uh, sort of uh, a, a extra extra value is that since we're creating a first and a second lien, okay, the note creator stays in the second lien position. And I think it's extremely valuable because the note creator has all the information, knows the property, and probably has a relationship with the buyer uh, because they had a conversation with them probably is local to the property and it just keeps them in, if their majority of their, of their profit is in the form of the cash flow from the second note. You know, I love when, when people are in the second lien position that have some skin in the game because it just protects my position. I mean, if I'm in the first lien position, uh, that's only added. It's like having an additional uh, co-signer on a loan. Heck, I'll add three or four. I don't really care sometimes because the more the merrier when it comes to protection protecting the investment, okay? So here's a little quick tip for anybody that's buying notes, okay? Or creating notes. I, I call it, uh, it's the ZHVI, which stands for Zillow Home Value Index. So go into Google and just type in ZHVI in the zip code and you'll get a median home price, okay? And what's what's what I like about this is if I'm buying a note and I'm, or I'm creating a note, I wanna know what the median is. And I surely don't want to be above the median by a large percentage. I don't want to be in the upper 20 or 25 percentile of that. I want to be below it. I like to be the median or below. And I'm going to show you an example of what that looks like. And this example is 282,000. It also gives you the, the, the one year change. So this zip code has gone up 27 percent in the last 12 months. Now, that is going to definitely change because we've already shifted away from being a, a uber hot seller market starting to cool off, these numbers will change and it will start to decrease over time. But that doesn't change the difference on the value index, okay? So this could still be 282 next year, maybe be 285, but the, the, the percent change might be three or 5%. So why is this important? Well, let's just look at an asset for a second, okay? So in an asset that we just did, we sold it for 175, the, 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 the ARV value was 215, but the median home price is 282. All right, why is that important? Well, it, it may not be important, but what I, what I like to see is that I'm gonna acquire an asset for $175,000 and I bought it at a 60, 70% investment to value, but, the, but the, the value of that neighborhood in that zip code is much higher than my property. I'm on the lower end of the spectrum which is where exactly I would want to be in the event that I had to take a property back in the event of a default. It doesn't mean the note's going to default. It doesn't mean it's not going to perform. It's just another variable that we look at when we're creating the notes. And guess what? When we go to sell the notes, this data is there as well. Okay. So let's go on to the next one here. Uh, let me move this out of the way because I just moved it. And I can't get it. Nick, we got a couple questions on yeah, yeah, here. Go ahead. Yeah. So on that... Uh... Ravel asked, what was that Zillow code again? So it's just, uh, I'm trying to move this thing out of the way for me. Oh, let me go, let me go back. I don't think I can go back. Uh, so it's ZHVI, okay, which is this right here. Z, so it's ZHVI and then whatever the zip code is. 
Okay, okay. cool. So go to Google, just type in ZHVI zip code 75142, and you get a little you get a little statistic report for that particular zip code. It's really helpful if you're looking at a note to buy, um, because in this example here, if I'm paying, if you know, if this if this came out and say the Zillow Home Index was 140, okay, and the value because there's properties that are worth 210 thousand dollars in a medium home price neighborhood of 140 it happens all the time, right? So that's all we're saying. That's that's the picture that I'm looking at and showing there. So that hopefully that answers the question. Yep. Just put ZH value and zip code in there. In the thing. Was there any other questions before I move on? Yeah, Vicky asked a question. So the note creator stays in the second lien position. How did the seller become to be in the second position? One of my missing Vicky, they're creating a first and a second. So like an 80% first and a 20% second or a 15% second. Right, I think it's on the next slide. Let's go to the next yeah. slide and see if it shows you that because that's a great All question. Right, cool. And if not, I'll try to break it down. All right, let's see here. Okay. Yeah, I think, yeah. Um so yeah, well, it doesn't show it on here specifically. So this is sort of the summary on it, right? So this sold up for 175, got $15,000 down. So the down payment gets kept by the, by the creator, right? This is in the note creator side. Seller finance, this particular one was done at a 75% first. So 132 of 175 is um, the, the first lien note value. The difference, which doesn't show up on here, we can do the math on it real quick, 132, plus 15 is 147. Uh, so what's that, a $28,000 second note, okay? So the, the seller, the note creator stays in this deal with a $28,000 note because they sold the first off at a 75%. So the, this situation, they got 8.6% down, they wrote a 75% first. So that turns out to be what, about a, uh, what does that come out to be? 17%, give or take, 17, yep. 16, 17%. Second, okay. So, so let's break this down for a second. So, the note buyer that's going to buy the first lien wins because they bought a hundred. They bought a hundred thirty-two thousand dollar note at a nine and a half percent coupon for one twenty-eight in this example against a property that's worth two hundred fifteen thousand dollars. Okay, against the market median home price of two eighty-two. I like my chances as a note buyer if that if I can get that quality of a note. Now there's a premium with that, but I but I get you know a lot of people want can want the convenience of the known the known quantity. I know that's what I do. That's why we write it. So in this situation, the investment to value is sixty four percent for the buyer. I don't have the second lien on there. I probably I think I had it on her and I took it off. But the, but in this situation, um, the net cash on this deal it might be actually on the next slide. Um, was probably five or six thousand dollars plus the free and clear second note. It's a great model. I mean, because it takes you out of the risk perspective if you're going to be creating and you end up with a bunch of, if you're a creator, you end up with a bunch of free and clear second notes or very little investment to get a very, very large second note. And the first lien holder wins because he's buying it at such a low investment to value. Whereas if you write it for a big, large first lien, the discount you're going to have to take is going to wipe out the majority of the profit. That's why we don't recommend doing it. And I would rather defer it because I, I know that the note's going to likely perform if we underwrite it and structure it correctly. Any other questions on that? I think we'll get a little bit more when we go to the underwriting, but I want to make sure before we move on, I don't uh, miss something on that. We good? Vicky asks if you're in a second lien position and the bar stops buying, uh, stops paying you, do you still have the right to foreclose subject to the first? Yeah. As always, 100%. And we're going to talk about how that's a great question. And when we get to the underwriting side of this, I'm going to, tell, when I'm going to show you and tell you what we do and how I do it sort of gives us an extra couple layers of protection on that. So let's go on here. So do, 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 I got to go back to the screen. All right. So this is, let's do a quick little recap. Okay. We're um, if you're a wholesaler, realtor, fix and flipper, landlord, private money lender, IRA note investor, you can be on either side of the fence on this. You can either be a, a creator or a buyer, okay? We also buy notes too. And what we do, and we work with people so that people can do it, if they follow the protocol, we become a buyer um, uh, as a result of following it. But if you bring me a note or bring us a note and it wasn't followed the, 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 the protocol and system and process we recommend, we will likely not be a buyer because we would probably make you an offer or indicative bid, but we're, it's probably gonna be at a very low price because we're gonna go fix it 
to make it look like we want it to look like, okay? So um, so let's talk about structuring the deal real quick here, okay? Um, oh, before that, let's get into the numbers, okay? So this comes from Paperstack. Let me know what Paperstack is. It's a great prop platform if you're looking to buy or sell. But I love other people's numbers because I can just leverage and put them up against what we're actually doing ourselves. So as we get into this, I want to point out a couple of things from, uh, from their report, okay? And I highlight them in yellow. I'm just going to go with the first one. So the first one talks about performing versus non-performing. Of all the assets that sold on their platform, 74% of assets sold were performing. Well, it gets back to the supply and demand piece. Well, I want to be on the side. I want to be able to sell something that's performing, okay? Well, brand new note by definition is, is not not performing. So I guess it's technically performing, but it's not non-performing. I know that for sure. The other thing I like is that uh, here and going to the left to right, um, all the notes that are sold were first position notes, 84%. So all the notes that were sold were 84%. Now, does that mean there wasn't that many second liens on the note on the platform? Maybe not, but just objectively looking at it, first lien positions are more valuable and then desirable than second. That's why I have no problem keeping the second and selling the first because I don't have to discount it because if you discount it, you lose all your profit on the, on the second note. Going down here, Another another statistic I think is just very, very valuable, mortgage note for, versus contract for deeds, okay? 78% were, were sold were mortgage notes. Now, there again, I don't know if they were that was that high because there's just that many more mortgage notes versus contract for deeds, but I do know that more contract for deeds are, are deeply penalized by most sophisticated note buyers relative to mortgage, mortgage notes, okay? Does it, mean, does it mean it should be? I don't know, but that's just a, a, a statement of fact. And the last thing in here, um, single, most assets are sold in single single assets versus pool. And the main reason is because most people either A, don't have enough assets to create the notes on, or B, they, you know, they, they don't have time on their size to build a big enough portfolio up to sell them in a pool, okay? Which is hence the problem is that most, note buyers to get you maximum value are going to want to have a large tranche of notes to take down because they just, they didn't, they can't deal with a bunch of $150,000 notes. It's not efficient for them to do. Okay. Let's go on to the next slide. Let's see. So why create the perfect note? And I think this is where I, I want to spend all the time on what we see from our experience and our track record that our note sales average 90% or above of UPB. So um, if you if you believe what the paper stack numbers uh, to be accurate, they were 82 to 84 percent, depending on which number you're looking at. We're well above 90. So just by creating it the, the, the right way and following uh, better uh, business practices, then the, the note value that you're going to get back uh, on the sale is going to be somewhere in the eight to 10 percent higher than than the average. OK, so what does that mean? Well, if you're going to create a million notes, a million dollars worth of notes, that would end, end up netting you about an extra eighty thousand dollars to your bottom line. It's significant. Then not that hard to go do six or seven hundred fifty thousand dollar notes. Not anymore. It's not. It's there. And so, um, but that's what's going to get you the max max value um, when you do. And there's a lot of other factors. And I I I I use the analogy. I'm in Texas. My, I use it. I call it my Ford F one fifty example. So. You know, you have two um, white Ford F-150s with 50,000 miles. They both were built in 2015. And, uh, you know, they're white with tan interior. But one of them has perfect maintenance records. There's not a scratch or ding on it. Uh, it's, in, it's in pristine condition. The other one looks like it's been through a tornado. You know, the, the, there's, the, the seats are torn up. There's no records. The tires are bald. The brakes don't work. There's not a, a there's not an inch of paint that's not scratched, dinged, or damaged. Which one of those is worth more money? Okay, doesn't mean that you can't buy the 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 beat up one for a better price and fix it and maybe end up uh, in a better position in the long run. But that's not what most note buyers truly want. They want something that's going to perform and move and, and and be dependable. That's what I've seen from my experience of 
doing this. They don't want to have to mess around with a non-performing note. Okay. Non-performing notes are work. Okay. Does it mean everything that we write is going to perform? Absolutely not. But I like our chances a lot better when we've done all the things that are necessary to give us the best chance of, of, uh, of obtaining um, long-term cash flow through a performing, through a performing note. Okay. Cause that's exactly what the banks want. The funds want the private equity groups, the family offices want, they don't want to mess around with anything. They want to deal with a predictable return and they're willing to pay a premium for it and even take a little bit less of a yield on it, knowing that they don't have to mess with, mess around with it. Cause all those things cost them time and money and velocity. So how do you create the perfect note? Okay. Um, well, I think that's what I want to spend a few minutes doing here. The good news is, I'm going to go back to this other slide, is that you're better off not doing it. You're trying to do it yourself, but let somebody that has the expertise and experience do it for you, okay? Um, you're going to have to pay somebody to do something anyway. So at least, because here's what happens, okay? You have a title company and you and they, uh, you have the, the attorney create the promissory notes, for example, Okay. But they write it from a legal perspective. They don't write it from a bank's perspective or a note holder's perspective. Well, there's a lot of things that you can integrate into the, the, that, those, that verbiage of those notes that gives you extra layers of protection uh, as you go on, okay? But we talked about the, the ability to fully underwrite the, buy, the, the buyer. Um, I think Dodd-Frank and the RMLO is extremely important. We're going to talk about that here in a second and so on. So just know that there's a, there's a place that you can go to have somebody manage the transaction um, if you choose to, if you really are seeking not only maximum uh, the maximum price if you want to sell it, but if you want also want to stay in the deal um, long term. And it also just the, the legal protection of it too. A lot of people make um, mistakes in the creating of the paperwork. And once that borrower signs those closing documents, you cannot go back and fix fix some things. Okay. So this is it. Orange stuff is what we're, you're, you're done it. The bottom stuff is what we can help you do if you choose to. And if not, at least get a copy of a, um, we'll provide everybody a copy of a redacted file of all the documents and stuff that's in it, Scott. If they just gonna, they can just reach back out to us. We'll give them oh. permission. I'd be happy to provide that to them so they can, if they really want to go look and create it and see what's in it. Um, I'm really more about education first to be able to get them to create the right, the, the notes the correct way. Awesome. Did you have some, did you have, okay, good. So some of the things that gets done that, that most people neglect, or, and it's, these are just high level stuff. Um, they don't put all the required documents. They don't use an RMLO. You know, they don't do disclosures. For example here, there's probably 25 to 30 disclosures in a properly underwritten borrower file. And I can promise you, on the files that I look at that don't use RMLO, the disclosures do not exist. And those disclosures are there for a very specific reason. Because when Dodd-Frank was written, it was they, they, they wrote it, well, it's debatable, but they, they, it was really to protect the borrower, so they say. I, maybe they did, maybe they didn't, but let's assume that that's the reason they did it. Well, when a borrower goes through and they, they put their name and they sign on 25, 30 disclosures, in my opinion, that's protecting me as the creator of the note because of all the stuff that is in that file that, that adds another layer of security for us um, in the event that anything ever material materializes down the road, okay? Um, we always use a third-party servicing company. Very, very important uh, for a lot of different reasons. A um, couple, couple highlights on there is that when we write the, the, the promissory note with two, two liens, um, it's one payment letter and it goes to one servicer. And there's only one servicing fee and it gets applied accordingly through, this, with, through, the, uh, through the paperwork. And what's nice about that is that as long as the, the buyer of the first lien leaves it with that servicer, um, it's very, uh, very effective in keeping everything performing and protects the second, the second lien note holder as well. Now, there's always times that we sell it and they want to self-service. That's great, but, um, and we'll cross those bridges when we get to them. But in the beginning, we want everything going in, the borrowers making one payment. We always escrow taxes and insurance. It's never an option. Um, and then what's nice about it when it comes into the servicer, then they distribute the funds 
as as uh, as dictated per the agreement to the first and the first lien holder, second lien holder, acts uh, the escrows and uh, of of insurance and taxes as well. We always get a lender title policy as well, and that's a lot of things I see missing in a lot of uh, collateral files. That there is no lender title policy. You can always add a lender title policy. It's extremely expensive to add a lender title policy after the fact, but most people that don't out of sight, out of mind, if they don't see it and it's not on their checklist, a lot of times it gets missed when they buy the note and that and hence can cause an issue later down the road. Okay. Some other documents, mortgage deed of trust, document checklist, all the due diligence, collateral files, all the verbiage that goes in the notes, the payment letters, how the servicing is structured. Um, disclosures and how we write the disclosures, how we write insurance, borrower insurance. Uh, one of the things that we like to do is we list the 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 uh, the servicer as our mortgagee on the on the insurance policy. The reason why we do it is one, they have a fiduciary responsibility to us anyway. Two, that's their job to manage that. But three is that when we turn around and sell that first lien to a new note buyer, we don't have to necessarily go back in and change it, which is extremely, you know, time consuming and, and an issue. You have to have the borrower go and update that. And it's just, we try to eliminate that stuff uh, in the beginning. Same thing with our trustee. We have, we make sure that whoever's listed on the note as a trustee is somebody that's, that could, that can handle a foreclosure trustee, uh, a foreclosure in the event of that happening. We want to have that already done in the beginning. You can always change it. But we always want to focus on getting it best as uh, best as possible from the very beginning. And these are all approved docs that I personally approved that I've done from years and years and years. And they're all there now. they will be different for different states, but conceptually they're all relatively the same. So this is just an example of all the documents that you should be looking at. I didn't have enough room to put them on one side. And I really honestly didn't want to break them down any deeper. There's a lot of documents. There's buy side documents. Uh, when the property is bought, we like to see those in there. We have no problem disclosing them because if you're going to stay in the deal in a second lien position, you may need to go back to those at some point in time. You may need to see a owner title policy. The reason why we put them in there when we sell is that they're really not that they're not really not that important to the transaction. But what we've learned over time, it's inevitable that somebody wants something from before, and they inevitably ask a question. When people ask questions. It takes time because you got to go look and try to figure out where they all were. So by just providing everything from the very beginning to the note buyer, it just makes things a lot cleaner um, from the very beginning. Um, a couple of the highlights on here, uh, I think I already addressed them, uh, two of them at least. The RMLO package, extremely important to go through that. You know, when it goes into the transaction management um, system and, and it's being done for you, the RMLO is set up on your behalf with the buyer and the RMLO to get it, the documents created. So you're not going out and trying to find that, uh, that RMLO to do that, uh, that underwriting for you. Proof of buyer's insurance. I think we talked about that. We just, um, on there, we make sure we list the, uh, I list the servicer as my mortgagee um, on it. And the other thing that we put in a lot of stuff, when we, when we sell this property, we do it. We highly recommend it. A lot of people don't do it. We always try to put a right of first refusal to buy that property back if that buyer decides to sell at some point in the future. Because if I, I if I have an op opportunity to get that property back and it's a really good owner finance top property, I have the ability to buy it. I can have it buy it back and I can recreate the process because properties are hard to find, at least the ones that you want to, that you've already done the work on. If you already fixed it, for example, you're a fix and flipper and you already fixed it once three years ago. And you already know what you did. Nice to come back and buy a property that you already have. We can put those ter those terms in there as well, file it with the closing documents, record it, and have that on there. It doesn't mean you're going to buy it, the property back. It doesn't mean the seller has to sell it to you. It's just one more thing that allows you to look at it. And then on the note sale side, you know, all the purchase plus all the other documents on the buying side that go in that note sale package, purchase sales agreement, the collateral assignments, transfer transfer docs and lounges. That's all part of this process too. So. When you, uh, when you, if you choose to use this to do under, uh, to do the transaction management, you get the management of all this, the creating of all the documents, the archive of all the documents, and then also the facilitation of the closings for both the selling of the property to the borrower as well as the selling of the note if you decide to sell it. So, um, pretty valuable stuff in my opinion. 
Um, I don't get any complaints on it. And it's, like I said, it's probably twice as cheap as if you try to do it yourself, five times, five times more valuable if you, if you, if you screw it up instead. So um, let's go. I think we're about done here. Selling a note. We got a few. We're good. We got yeah. a few questions. So selling a note, you know, we're, the key to this is we do, do create a premium note of value, which is the difference between the performing and the note. We already talked about the Ford F-150. Um, I, you know, this re this will recap. We want all our first liens to be under a, a 75% first lien percentage. Um, if you download that that modeling software, you can it defaults in there and you can show right away before you even decide to go even go in to create a note that you know, maybe if it, if it really makes sense or not to structure it or how you need to adjust it. So it does either on the buy side or the percentage side. Um, I think that's probably close. Oh, yeah. So if you want, um, you can scan this code here. Um, you can scan it. You can, th that'll get you in. Um, you can register and then they'll send you a copy of the deal analyzer. Or you can <laughs> directly. You'll get a copy of the $4.7 trillion secret. So if you're doing any, that's more on the IRA side. So if you're doing anything relative to the IRAs, might be something of value, value to you. We also do have a private Facebook group where we talk about the creating side of it, the front end of it, which is finding the deal, analyzing the deal, uh, funding the deal, and then, uh, and then finding the seller finance buyer before you take it over to transaction management. That's what the Facebook group does. We go live once a week. You can just, it's free. You just join if you want to. Uh, you can also join our note buyers list if that's something that you're interested in learning more about the notes that we, ha we have available. Most of the notes we have pre-sold or they're sold fairly close to after we create them. Um, and, you know, if you need to reach out to me directly, uh, you can do so through the website, USA Note Pro, or directly here at Nick at USA Note Pro. Um, and that is, I think, all of it, Scott. So hopefully there's some questions. Hopefully yeah. we have, uh, you know, some things that we can go back and share. I'm going to stop sharing my screen real quick. No, keep, no, keep, keep that up a little bit. Oh, yeah. Okay, go back. Back. No, no back. Yeah, keep it, keep it up for a little bit for folks. To... All right. Let me share it. There you go. Cool. <laughs> All right. So we got a couple of questions. Somebody asked, so when you set it up, the search, do you own the servicing company as well? Who are you using for service? No, I do not. Well, it depends, right? Because we do stuff in you know, all 50 states. Um we, uh, I primarily use uh, August REI in the state of Texas. Um, uh, I don't have any interest in that company other than that they have uh, the majority of the notes on the platform. When I started using them, they had probably six or 700 notes on there. And now between myself and the notes that we've um, sent their way through relationships, um, you know, several thousands of notes. And I think they have six or seven on their platform now. But what's nice about it when it comes through this, when it comes through this um, process, there everything's treated as if it was one it was ours. So we have a very specific pot process that they follow relative to the way we structure it. That goes with the title company, that goes with the servicers, that goes with the RMLOs as well. We do not, we use our title companies, we use our attorneys, we use our documentation. If you, you everybody's more than willing to use whatever they want to use. It's just, I'm just going to tell you right now, we will likely not be a buyer for any of that note paper. It just, I've been there and I've done it. It's just like, I can, it's like, it's like gun, it's like gun safety, right? I can give you the gun, but if you don't have the right safety to do it, you're just going to end up, you know, shooting yourself in the foot or something. And I'm not, I just don't want that to happen, to be quite honest with you. The mm -hmm. notes that we write have been bought, bought by financial institutions. Hell, the company was bought by a bank. Um, uh, can you write them a different way? Absolutely. Uh, I just know that our model works and most people are extremely um, satisfied with it. The, the note buyers um, like the paper because they don't have to screw around with a bunch of, you know, stuff that's missing or not compliant or, um, you know, a, a note that doesn't perform at the end of the day. Well, it's, it, it's literally written like a bank. I mean, it's written like a bank loan with all the disclosures. A lot yeah. of people try to get away without doing a lot of stuff and it's clean well written, everything's dotted and crossed and tied it takes up. A lot of energy and effort to do it the right way. I'm telling you right now. Yeah, you exactly. know, it takes a lot of energy and effort. And and I, as much as I hate that part of the process, 
it's just a necessary evil if this is the business that you want to be in long term. The way I look at it is this, it's a small price to pay for something that has up to a 30 year life, you know, yeah. you're doing exactly. something that's going to get that you're going to get the benefit for potentially 30 years. So um, I want to spend the time and build it right from the foundation up so that it withstands the test of time as mm -hmm. best as best as possible. So we got a question here. Uh, Jay, he's probably new to notes. He says, how would I, you help if I want to convert an investment property from a mortgage note to a seller finances? Is there an advantage to the seller? And, and Jay, I think we need a little bit more information on it. If you've got a, 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 a already so a note. investment property or is it a note that he already has? I guess it might. I well, it sounds like he's got an investment property with a traditional mortgage on it. And he wants yeah. to, I mean, You'd have to either a cash it out, or you do a wraparound mortgage, so or do a sub two deal uh, on stuff like that. But it's uh, we need a little, probably a little bit more information to answer that question. Yeah, so you, you know, so you know, I'm going to put in the, the chat real quick. I, I think I I went by it, but if you go to Creative Dealmaker, I'm just typing it right now, maker.com slash video. There's the there's an there's an example of a video on on it was very similar to that. So we get asked all the time because there's a lot of people that like to do sub two wrap transactions, and I'm not opposed to them, and we do them all the time. But what's what's what I what I teach and what I tell people it doesn't matter how you acquire. You can acquire it with hard money, cash, you know, line of credit, seller financing, sub two, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. But when you go to exit. It's always the same. I mean, the creation of the of the of the exit is always the same. We always, I always write a first and a second lien. Always, even if I'm doing any of that stuff, even if I plan on staying in that forever, I always write a first and second because I want to give myself the option that if I need to liquidate on for some reason, I I don't have to liquidate. I can always sell the first and the second together as one note, but I might not need all of it because amortization is a very powerful tool. You know, and if you can even hold on to 25% of the deal in the form of the second and sell the first and pay off the underlying debt, I, why would you not do that? I mean, that's the whole point because I've done the math too many times, Scott. I had I just just consulted with somebody not that long ago. They go, well, the buyer gave me so much down paying payment that I didn't want to, he, he only wrote one mortgage and he didn't do it on what we told him to do. And he wrote, he only wrote one. I go, why did you only write one mortgage? He goes, because the second would have only been $10,000. I go, but you understand by not writing it, you took a $9,000 discount because the investment, the value and the risk was much higher for the note buyer. Would you rather have had a thousand dollars more cash or would you rather just had a thousand dollars invested to obtain a, a $10,000 second lien? Because a a thousand dollars on a on a ten thousand dollars second lien is gonna you're gonna get all your money back in months, plus you get the back end and the face value of the note is actually much greater than what the than what it actually is. The face value might say ten, but if it goes in in, in it goes full term, it's three x minimum. Yeah. You know, it's a thirty thousand dollar thing. So you do not want to discount any more than you have to. That's and I think so many people struggle with it. They don't, I mean, most people don't talk about that. And I'm like, you, you got to do that because you're going to take the discount. This is why you don't write a first for 95 because uh, you're going to take a discount off of, you know, being at that spot there. Uh, first lien, well, you, and I give you 75, 80 cents of, of the value. Well, that means you're taking a 16% discount. Whereas you don't, if you just wrote a second and held the second for cash flow. You know what I mean? Yes. Well, that's what, and that's what that model does. It shows that in there for you. So you can visually see it because, I learned this a long time ago. I would, I, I literally wrote 500 notes, Scott, and it probably cost me $6 million by the way that they were structured and the way I exited out of them. Yeah. I didn't lose $6 million. It cost me, and that's face value, $6 million. I mean, in perpetuity, it could have been 15, 20, $18 million. Let's not even talk about it. So I know, depressing me already. My loss is your gain. That's why we do it. That's why we do it. And, you know, you can, it's really the point, we're really trying to find the point of optimality where it's the win, win, win for everybody involved. And for me, creating the note and exiting out, this is what it gets you to. And note buyers have no problem paying a premium for a high quality paper that they can set and forget. Bottom line, they'll do it all day long.
Yeah, so, exactly. What's uh, the uh, what's the website again for the software? Yeah, so if, you go, software? if you go to Facebook and you should go to groups and you search Creative Dealmaker, um, you can find it. If you scan, uh, if you go and you scan the code, you'll get a you can get that too. But um, it's there. Go to Creative Dealmaker, search it in the Facebook group, and join the group. We got about four thousand people in the Facebook group right now. So, um, and it's only specifically about the front end of the transaction. And we do talk about note structure and why we structure it that way. Cause it's, it's a, look, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm, uh, it's, I'm a little bit selfish with this because I get the opportunity to look at really high quality notes that are created. You know, it's a win-win. I show you how to do it the right way so I can buy it, but it's a win-win. Everybody wins. If I don't hold it long-term and I want to sell it off, then whoever that note buyer is gets the benefit of a highly qualified created note. And can't there's not anything that that anybody loses in my opinion in the in the model so that's why yeah. we do it. so cool. t miller yeah he goes on he goes i've had clients i had a client come to me to enforce a note in foreclosure and i come to find out after reading the note on the mortgage agreement that the thing is completely unenforceable under the law or that they let the borrower's attorney prepare the note and it's essentially full of exculpatory clauses that prevent the enforcement <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's not a problem until it's a problem, Scott. I mean, that's the bottom line. Look, I can drive down the freeway 100 miles an hour without a seatbelt on, and it's not a problem unless I get in an accident, right? Well, guess what? I'm not taking any chances as as much as, I mean, I could still get hurt with a seatbelt on, don't get me wrong, but I like my chances of being less injured by being prepared and, and having it. And that's what we ultimately try to do when we create this these notes from the beginning and put the best business practice in, in place and really think, act, and be a bank. And when I when I say that, I mean it literally to the point of how they underwrite a buyer and how they approve a borrower. Um, it's just, it's just, it's just the right thing to do. And it's there's a lot of paperwork, man. Our files are really deep. But when we teach and educate note buyers, they only have to look at it one time yeah. and they understand it's the same. If it's always the same thing every single time, it makes the process extremely easy to replicate. And more importantly, it makes it super easy for the people um, that are going to end up being the note buyers once they know, like, and trust you that you have built this um, this high quality, high grade note that they're ultimately after. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. It's, it's better to a little insurance on the front end goes a long way. And I like to use analogy instead of getting a wreck. I mean, if you can drive on the highway with no insurance, it's all about when you do get in a wreck and bump into somebody that you need the insurance to make sure you're too late to have it then. Yeah, exactly. Allison asked, when does the Facebook group meet? Do you have regular so meetings? Typically, there? typically we do that. We do office hours live, Eric Sage and myself. We usually do it on Mondays at 1 p.m. Uh, 1 p.m. Central time. And it usually goes about 90 minutes. Uh, we, we stream, it's a Zoom register for it. We have everybody on it. We bring, bring questions in. We, we go through deal, deal or no deal analysis. We look at structure. Um, we also stream it live on Facebook. And then once you're in the Facebook group, if you're unable to attend, you can go back and watch the replays inside a Facebook group. It's really good. Even if it doesn't matter where you're at in the, in the note process. If you're looking to create, it's great. If you're looking to buy, it's better because now you know exactly what's happening. You know, everything's done on how to how to buy notes. Well, if you're going to buy a note, then you need to know really how to create the note as a result because people are looking for it. So we, it's a great, it's a, we get great, you know, um, uh, attendance and participation. It's up almost 4,000 people now. It's not even a year old uh, since we started it. Um, and I think it provides great value and really a sense of direction because it's exactly what I do every single day. And there's no, there's no fluff inside of it. Yeah, exactly. I agree there. So those that you guys have trouble, it's, it's basically looking for the Zillow value, Z-V-H-I, and then put a zip code in there yep. and it'll pop up easy. I just I just try Z-V-H-I plus a zip v- code that you're looking for. V-H-V-I, Zillow. Sorry, yeah, Zillow Home Value Index. I'm sorry. Yeah, exactly. V-H-V-I and the zip code and it'll pop that up. Yeah. Just a cool little tool that you can use to see where you are relative to the market because you know people buy notes all over the country, right? Cal- there's, you know, doctors in California are looking to buy notes in Cincinnati, Ohio, and they've never even been to Ohio. Well, this is just one more piece of data that helps you make a best, the best decision possible. Does it mean it's going to, your note's going to be great and perform? No, but I like data. I like information and I can make a decision, much more informed decision with more, more facts that I have. 
That's so true. That's so true. Let's see here. Um, I'm going back there. If that's answered. I think it's, let me see if I can. Put Let's see, it says, David asks if the servicer is the mortgagee, does that, doesn't that mean you lose control of the mortgage? Say that one more time, Scott. If the servicer is the mortgagee, doesn't no, that mean they have you a, lose? No, because they have a fiduciary responsible to me as the lender. Yeah. They're licensed and bonded. You know, what's the difference, what's the difference if I send my money to escrow at a title company? They, 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 that's their responsibility and, uh, you know, by, by, by agreement, by law, by, by, uh, um, by license. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't do it. I, I love it. Cause guess what? I don't have to do. I don't have to manage any of it. It's, I mean, if there's an insurance claim, guess what? They get to do all that. I don't have to mess with it, man. Who wants to mess with any of that stuff? They'll do it all. If there's a change in a the policy, there's a change in anything. They get all the notifications, not me. I might mm -hmm. be out of the country. They're going to know if somebody, if there needs to be updated or insured. Now, not everybody likes it. I'm just telling you what I do and why I do it. And um, I've never had an issue with it. And um, most people don't either. So there it is. Amen to that. I love it. Love good stuff, man. Great stuff there. Any other questions for Nick uh, here? Everybody, great questions. Keep asking them. Check it out there. Scan that code there for you. Uh, Vicky asked, not ab obligated to sell, but great for you. Uh, hang on here. Let me, we got a few folks that popped in there. Okay. So, David, he already answered the partials question. I guess you weren't listening. He, that's why he said go to a first and second versus doing a first and then selling a partial. You're still going to take a discount on a part that partial sale. Yeah. Well, the, the, um, so, so that's a great question. So, let me talk a little bit about that. So, you could do that, but guess what happens when you get a, when you, when you partial, you lose cash flow. Cash flow is gone forever, right? I mean, not gone forever. It's gone for as long as the, the partial sold for, right? Whereas when I do a first and a second, okay, I may still get some cash for that, but I get I don't lose my cash flow because the second is the cash flow. So, yeah. you know, it just depends on what you are ultimately after and what's important to you. Um, you know. Some people say, well, I'd rather just have all the money because I can invest it and make way more than 18% because I'm good at what I do. Other people are not very good at managing money and they'll spend it, right? I like cash flow. I like having a bunch of free and clear second notes that are sitting in my, my portfolio that I, I don't have any liability or debt on and I then and are in there and I can just let them perform. That's it. And I have other ones where I have first liens and that's a different story because it has a different function in the portfolio, right? So yeah. um, it just depends on where you are and what you want to do. I always say there's more than one way to get to Chicago. You can walk, ride a bike, take a train, ride a bus. You know, it depends. Depends on what you, why you need to get to Chicago, when you need to get to Chicago, how much money you have to get to Chicago. And there's no right or wrong answer. It's only what's right or wrong for you at the end of the day. So this is no different. I mean, if I was 20 years younger, I might have... I might have a buy and hold portfolio, Scott, but I'm not. So that's somebody else's decision to make on whether or not they want to have a rental portfolio. I can promise you, I have no desire to own a rental portfolio at my age when I can have free and clear performing mortgage notes or even any mortgage note that performs and I don't have to manage any of it because if you build the system correctly, 98% of that effort is done by the system and others, not by you. Amen to that. That's the beautiful. That's one of the things I love about notes. They've been there, done that with the fix and flips. And nobody wants to do that. No, Not, I mean, it, it's awesome. cool jobs. If I guess never want to sit around waiting on somebody or getting that call at two o'clock in the afternoon on a Sunday or two o'clock at night when something's wrong with the property, you know, yeah. and, and deal and the property managers. Yeah. I don't want to deal with property managers either. <laughs> I don't like people that much, Scott, to be quite honest with you. So I don't really want to talk. I don't really want to mess. I want to talk to anybody. I have a hard time getting along with myself. Well, we hope to see you this week, next weekend at the No Mastermind. I, we saved a few emails. Are you coming out? I know. I have, I have a little bit of a travel conflict. I'm going to try to get down there for part of it. Uh, we'll talk later in the week and get you an update, but hopefully I'll get a chance to make it down there and see everybody that's, that comes out to Austin and joins in. Sounds good. If not, we'll definitely grab a, a cold beverage sometime soon. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, guys. Hope, Thanks, this is, uh, hope this has been valued, everybody. Very, very much so. Thank you so much, Nick. All right. You guys be good. Take care. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, bud. Enjoy the rest of the week.